Time to talk about Intel for the news this week. Intel announced its other chipsets officially, so H670, H610, and B660 alongside the existing Z690 chipset. Intel also announced 22 other SKUs of its CPUs for desktop. Those would be the non-K variants, so things like the 12600 non-K, 12900 non-K, all those CPUs. Intel also went over a couple of other news items like some of its ARC GPU information. So we're going to be covering all of that in today's news video. Of course, following up the AMD announcement also from this week, and we already have coverage of that on the channel if you're curious what they're doing. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly. Thermal Grizzly's Hydronaut and Cryonaut thermal pastes are high-performing thermal interfaces for use on CPUs and GPUs. You can bring an old card back to peak performance by repasting it and doing preventative maintenance, and Thermal Grizzly's Hydronaut is ideal for water cooling and air cooling for new and old cards alike. Cryonaut paste is one of the top performing pastes for extreme overclocking with CPUs and GPUs and has been used in several world record scoring machines. Learn more at the link in the description below. So AMD this week announced its AM5 CPUs DDR5 support, all of that stuff. Intel has DDR5 support on Alder Lake, which it has already launched at this point, but it is now expanding its Alder Lake line as AMD ramps up with its own Zen 3D and eventual Zen 4 CPUs to combat Intel with its Alder Lake CPUs. Getting pretty interesting right now. Pretty spicy. NVIDIA, meanwhile, is working on GPUs, as you would expect. Uh, because at least until it owns ARM, it doesn't have any contributions to make to the CPU landscape. So let's start with the recap of Intel's chipset differences. This is the most interesting topic because the other non-Z690 chipsets are the ones that have the most potential to bring down pricing of motherboards. Intel Alder like motherboards have been painfully expensive this time around. The feature set you get at a given price point doesn't even come close to what you used to get in previous years. But there's been price creep with both Intel and AMD, specifically on the higher end enthusiast platforms. The lower end platforms are actually getting a lot more interesting than they used to be as a result of this. So first up, although there will probably be official announcements from motherboard manufacturers at the time of filming this, which is one day ahead of Intel's launch, the chipset uh, bearing motherboards for B660, H670 at all, those haven't been officially announced right now as I'm filming. Uh, so the best we have is a leak that suggests the price range for those boards will be about $120 to about $200, and that's with just ASUS boards that we know about today. Uh, and that will hopefully expand a little bit as they come out. But 200 is getting pretty high. You're encroaching on Z690 territory. It's how it always is with these, and 120 is at the low end. As for chipset differences, the main ones are pretty simple. Z690 is fully enabled. It's got everything that you can possibly get on Alder Lake anyway, and that includes overclocking for the CPU. Uh, memory overclocking the last generation, but now as well, has been expanded outside of just the Z690. So you still get that on some of the other platforms where you lose CPU overclocking. You still keep at least the ability to enable XMP past the official CPU spec for the memory supported list. For example, in the past, you might see DDR4-3200 as the maximum memory spec for a CPU where you could actually run maybe DDR4 or 4000 or whatever on it. So that's what that means. H610 is the only one where memory overclocking is not supported. And as a reminder, when we say memory overclocking here again, that includes getting XMP on for frequencies beyond the official CPU spec. So it doesn't mean you're literally in there tuning the memory. Not many people really do that. Uh, it just means enabling XMP or tuning the memory. DMI is the interface that connects the CPU to the chipset, and so it governs the maximum possible I.O. bandwidth. The B660 and H610 boards get cut down to four DMI 4.0 lanes, whereas H670 and Z690 offer more maximum I.O. capability between the CPU and the chipset. Quick refresher for anyone who is not fully up to speed on what exactly a chipset is. I'll keep it very simple for this video. It's just a news video. but. The CPU has its own I.O. capabilities where it can run 16 lanes in this particular example to PEG or PCIe graphics. So that would be your primary video card gets 16 lanes. Some boards you can split it to 2 by 8 and that's your graphics option. Uh, these CPUs can also do four lanes down to an M.2 SSD for higher speed NVMe uh, transfer. The rest of it comes out of the chipset. So the chipset and its HSIO lanes or high speed I.O. lanes are divided up by the motherboard manufacturer. They get to choose to some extent how the lanes are divided from the chipset into things like 10 gigabit ethernet. You might get another PCIe slot, like a by 16 slot that can support some kind of device, maybe a video card, not really the best way to use them, but you could theoretically put one in there. Uh, you might get a slot by four that supports capture cards, things like that. Those use your HSIO lanes off of the chipset itself. 
So you can imagine the block diagram where you've got the CPU down to GPU and down to the SSD directly. And then everything else is through middleman, the chipset that uh, processes all the other I.O., especially high-speed I.O. And the USB support goes to both the CPU and the chipset. So then, chipset PCIe Gen 4 lanes are not present on H610. There are 12 of these on Z690 and H670, and then there are six Gen 4 lanes on B660. These would be the ones that would be useful for non-SATA SSD, 10 GBE, capture card, all the stuff we just mentioned. The maximum USB port support also changes. We'll just highlight that on the screen. The Intel chart is a little bit misaligned here. The USB 2 ports should align with the lower set of numbers, for instance, not how whatever this is Intel made by accident, but we can't blame them too much because USB-IF is a horrible organization that hates everybody and names its products horrible things like USB 3.2 2x2, but that's a story for another time. This recaps the primary differences. You can think of Z690 as the highest end, H670 as the next highest end option for users who don't care about CPU OC, but mostly want the rest of it. And then B660 would be the next choice for a lower performance system. H610 cuts off a lot because it moves to a single memory channel here, keeping in mind that DDR5 behaves a little bit differently there, but uh, single memory channel support, whereas the others are dual channel support. Um, so that's a pretty significant cutoff, and it means that most people building H610 probably don't fall on our typical, more enthusiast-focused audience unless you're just building a system for a media center, some kind of home entertainment system, something simple like that, but otherwise not something that should really be on your radar for a high-performance system. Next one, Intel is launching the 22 non-K SKU CPUs. So 12900K, 12700K, 12600K, we've reviewed those. If you want another performance on the channel, it's been pretty promising so far for Alder Lake. And the new CPUs span from $42 at the low end, 1K unit pricing, up to $490, 1K unit pricing at the high end. Now, 1K unit here indicates that you might be paying a little bit more through the retailer, uh, depending on how, obviously, the, the quantity they're buying. Power range is, is 35 watts to 65 watts with the higher power parts having already previously launched. The i9-12900 non-K will be the $490 part, 16 cores for that, 8P cores, 8E cores. The frequency is reduced from the k skew part. It's down to 2.4 gigahertz P core base, 1.8 gigahertz E core base, and 5 gigahertz max turbo on the P cores. For core count, these are mostly recognizable. It's the frequencies that primarily change with that TDP reduction, with that power reduction. Total CPU PCIe lanes is recognizable at 20 for every part shown on the list. That'd give you four for an SSD and 16 for a GPU. The 12600 CPU is interesting. It comes in at $223 with the 12400 at a predictable $190. Intel is doing its usual thing where there's a CPU nearly every 10 to $20. That's largely because of the OEM demand. So there's also a 12500 in here at $200 and a 12400F at $167. The 12400F gets rid of the IGP or the integrated graphics processor, so you would use that if you're definitely using some other GPU uh, dedicated video card in the system. That makes the 12400F probably the most interesting or potentially compelling for a budget system that is still probably fully capable of playing games. We looked at a 12400 engineering sample already. Uh, spoiler alert, the engineering sample that we happened to get was severely limited. So all we really got was some of the CPU performance. We didn't get a true look at the gaming performance or anything that accesses the GPU because of the limitations of uh, how we had to connect the video card to it. So we haven't really looked at a 12400 for real yet, and we'll be doing that as soon as we can with these. 12400F, though, is the one to keep an eye on. That's going to be hopefully sort of the savior for the budget class gaming PC right now. As for the i3 CPUs, Intel has those spanning $97 to 143 Below that, you're in Celeron class. Uh, these are 4P cores, 0E cores, but they are 8 threads at least. So it's kind of back similar to that uh, i7-7700K type of CPU in an i3 part for cheaper. That's where they are for these. There are not any E core only parts, at least on these lists. It appears to be at worst 2P cores, 0E cores. Intel also announced its new CPU coolers, replacing its exceptionally boring and unremarkable previous stock CPU coolers with a set of CPU coolers that it is naming Laminar, as opposed to Turbulent, we suppose. Uh, this is a move in the right direction because the cooler marketing is something AMD started doing with Ryzen. It was received very well, considering how historically boring stock CPU coolers have been. Actually, Wraith started just before Ryzen came out and was generally received well. So Intel is doing this now with its stock coolers. It has three of them. Uh, they will be included with the non-K CPUs. Just 
quick note there, we're not 100% sure what the DIY retail market will look like, if literally 100% of the non-KCBs will have them, or if it'll be uh, something that is marked on the box as included, not included. We'll see once it sort of comes to fruition, but uh, something to look out for. Intel's highest performing option is called the Laminar RH1. That is paired with the Intel i9 non-K CPUs. It's followed by the Laminar RM1. That's with the i7, i5, and i3 CPUs. And finally, the Laminar RS1 for the Pentium Gold and Celeron CPUs. The RH1 includes RGB LEDs and a copper slug in the middle. These are all downdraft coolers, as you can see in the photo uh, or the renders. And so the RH1 runs taller than the others. That's its primary advantage for cooling. They're sparse on surface area for fins exceptionally sparse because the fan is placed internally within the fins. Some benefits to this, some downsides. The biggest obvious downside is less surface area, uh, but depends on sort of the, the design and power of the fan. We intend to get these in for testing. We'll probably look at them compared to some standard cheap, maybe $20, $30 coolers like the Vetri V5 and see how it works out, uh, see what sort of what, what the limit is of these coolers reasonably and if you should bother using them or not. So that's really all we have on the coolers. We're genuinely interested in them. Coolers are always kind of fun to look at, uh, and these are new from Intel. Finally, the laptop CPUs. We don't really cover laptops so much, so we'll leave this one to just putting the specs on the screen and giving them a quick mention. Intel announced its H-series CPUs in Alder Lake. These are the uh, first Alder Lake mobile CPUs. That would include the 12900HK and the 12900H non-K in the i9 45-watt territory then the 12800H, 12700H, and 12650H in the i7 territory, and there are also three i5 SKUs. Looking at the specs, the i9 and the top two i7 CPUs all have eight e-cores, whereas the i7-12650H runs only four e-cores. Confusingly, perhaps the i5-12600H and 12500H have eight e-cores once again, but decrease the p-core count by two from what you see on those i7s. Cache also decreases with these, although that is expected. So that's it for the Intel announcements. We have the AMD coverage on our channel already, and video will be going up next after this one, uh, and that'll wrap up the big three, but then we have all kinds of case, cooler, power supply, other coverage from the show as it exists this week, and a lot of news this week, and then we're kind of back to normal reviews. So stick around for all that. Subscribe to make sure you catch it and stay up to date on the industry. You can go to store.gamersaccess.net to grab one of these limited shirts, the Disappointment 2021 shirt from our Disappointment PC build, which you should watch if you haven't yet. It's got the most disappointing launches of 2021 marked on the back of the shirt, uh, and then the sort of sands of time on the front with the GPU shroud enclosing it. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.